Over the years, I've heard people mention that they attended high school at Brigham Young High School. But even after BY High closed its doors in 1968, teachers kept creating courses for distance education students. In January 2020, BYU launched a new full-time high school, BYU Online High School. Now, students can once again earn a high school diploma through BYU. BYU Online High School offers three different diploma programs, full-time semester-based enrollment, the FLEX program, and the Adult Education Diploma program. Teenage students in grades 9 through 12 enjoy fun online activities, clubs, free tutoring, live online classes, and much more. Learn more, sign up for an info session, and register at highschool.byu.edu. It is a love story that sounds like it came from a Nicholas Sparks novel, but Kevin and Lindsay Ralph's love story is entirely true. When they had not been dating very long, Lindsay was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. After dating for several years, the couple was married in January 2020 and later sealed on November 5th, 2021. Just 11 days later, on November 16th, Lindsay passed away at the age of 41. In many ways, this story is better than a Nicholas Sparks novel. It is the story of a love that has the ability to go on forever. Kevin Ralph works in digital marketing for Aspen Appraisal Group, but he also simultaneously runs a website called utahconcertreview.com where he uses his lifelong love for music in his role as editor-in-chief. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Morgan Pearson, and I am honored to have my friend Kevin Rolfe on the line with me today. Kevin, welcome. Morgan, thank you so much for having me. Well, I have told Kevin this before we started recording, but over the last year or so, over and over again, I've had this feeling that I needed to reach out to him and see if he would be willing to share his story. And I finally did it because I felt like enough time had passed that it would it would be something where both of us would not spend the entire time crying through the episode. But if that happens, Kevin, it's totally okay. (laughs) That's good to know. (laughs) But as we start out, when you started dating Lindsay, this is the one thing that I wasn't totally clear on as I was preparing my questions. When you started dating Lindsay, had she already been diagnosed with cancer? Uh, No, she hadn't. She was diagnosed about two years into us uh, dating. Okay. And tell me a little bit, just to give people an idea of what Lindsay is like, tell us about what initially attracted you to her. Well, it's funny because this is going to sound weird, but hear me out. I, I What initially drew attracted me to her, I don't really know. And this is what I mean. We matched on a dating app. I used to like to joke that we met in a grocery store and we're both reaching for the same avocado, you know, one (laughs) one of those like romantic movies or whatever, you know, rom-coms. But there's just something, you know, when you're on those apps, you're kind of swiping and and different things catch your eye. And there's just something that caught my eye. Every one of her pictures looked different. So it wasn't necessarily like a visual attraction because I I wasn't sure which one I would joke with her. I'm like, I don't, I didn't know which one was you, but um, (laughs) I think it was just the way she wrote in her profile was just very non-pretentious and non uh, it's kind of like those profiles you're kind of advertising in a way. And it just wasn't like that. It was just kind of like, this is me. And, and, and I, I think I just kind of liked it. So I thought, Hmm, what almost like a, why not? You know? And cause you just, I mean, I don't know that any of, us, any of us really expect to meet somebody on one of those apps. And sure enough, we matched. And then really, I guess the real thing was just in conversation. I just enjoyed 
talking with her. I thought she was really funny, which is something that I really uh, place a high level of importance in. And she just was very witty, very funny. And then um, by the time we finally met, you know, she was beautiful and um, just had an uh, infectious laugh. And, and I could just tell she was really nice. And that's something that was always important to me. I always wanted to be with somebody really nice, which sounds like, yeah, sure, why not? But there's just a genuine niceness about her that was like far beyond what I'd ever seen in somebody. And so I guess that would be it. Well, I met Lindsay one time and can attest to that, (laughs) that she has a goodness about her and I the kind of goodness that draws draws people in and makes them want to get to know her. Kevin, one thing that I noticed is that even before you got married, you frequently added a hashtag on your post on social media. And that hashtag said this team. I'm curious, what did that mean? So one of the things that we connected on is we're both big baseball fans. Uh, I'm a huge Los Angeles Dodgers fan, and this is this will th- this is one of the things I really loved about her. I, you know, <laughs> you, like if I was to ask you who's your favorite college basketball team, you would specifically say the University of North Carolina Tar Heels, correct? That's right, correct. <laughs> With her, she was a history teacher and ever the historian. She said the 1999 Yankees. So this <laughs> one specific team is the team, you know, and, and it's, I don't know. I just, gosh, it just really, I loved it. And so anyway, we would love baseball and throughout the course of our first year dating, we would watch Dodger games and we even went to California and went to one. And when they went into the playoffs, they used the hashtag this team throughout that playoff run. Mm. And as time went on, you know, in our dating, we dated for, three years before we got married. And the reason why is in, within the first year, her son had some uh, health issues. And I think I think the instinct is to be like, well, this guy's going to run because who wants to, who doesn't, guy who doesn't have kids, who's going to jump in and want to be with this situation that's just a little uh, unsettled. And, and so I think initially I just said it, not as a joke, but just lightheartedly, I'm like, I'm not going anywhere, you know, and I just would say this team. So I started to use it on social media as kind of a not so secret, but a message to her that we're a team and and not to be super sports analogy, you know, uh, but just to use that term and personalize it. I kind of helped because then in another year she was diagnosed and I think she we weren't married or engaged. And I think she thought you have every right to go to run like you don't need to be part of this. This isn't your thing. And so I would then again say this team. And so then when anything got hard or difficult, we would look at each other and one of us would say it. And so it's just kind of our little saying that it's based out of this playoff run from my favorite uh, baseball team. But I just uh it just seems so fitting for the things that we went through. Yeah. Kevin, why didn't you run when those hard things started to come? That is, that's a good question. And in the midst of all that, I would ask, I think sometimes you think, well, I'm not going to run because like, that's just not what I consider myself a good guy. So I think that's not what a good guy does. Right. But in the thick of it, in the, difficulty of some of these things you do have to ask the question like am i suited for this am i the right person to be for this can i do this and it always just came down to uh, never really more questioning it just came down to yeah i i loved her so much and i just and that's just kind of what it came down to i just wanted to be there and and i felt like she needed uh just that sidekick always to never question that this guy is going anywhere. It just was, and I knew it was going to be me and I wanted it to be me. And I'm really honored that it was me. I love that. 
Um, Kevin, you two were married in January 2020. And in March 2020, you discovered she was at that point when you got married in remission, but you discovered that her tumors had returned. Lindsay was participating in and undergoing treatment in a clinical trial that I know you all were really hopeful about. But in the end, she posted and said she had learned it wasn't a fit for her. Her cancer had gotten worse. What did you learn from Lindsay about acting in faith in terms of, you know, taking that risk, um, but then also accepting when the results are not what we'd hoped. Well, this one is, it's, I've been thinking about this and it's a little difficult to answer, but I think the thing that I love so much about her through all of this is she was such a a fighter. She was very kind and loving, but she was also very feisty. And in this regard, I think a lot of people to comfort her or to, you know, just share their love, you know, it would be sharing their testimony of the gospel or the, the plan, you know, and, and that things happen for a reason or, or just a lot of things that people say. And, and I don't necessarily disagree with any of those things, but sometimes in the midst of it, it doesn't necessarily help. Right. And so with her, it was like, no, like, I want to be here. I want to raise my son. I want to be cured of this. I'm going to do everything that I can. And she was never in denial. She was never pretending, you know, that this wasn't a thing. She was very aware of her mortality. And and within that, I think it brought her the faith to know I if I do everything that I can, whether it's, you know, entrusting the doctors in in my diet or whatever I have to do and it doesn't work. I know I've done everything and she just had faith that this was the way it was supposed to go. But it was something I was really always impressed with because on my end, it's trying to just to be a support. And sometimes that's hard because I, I, it seemed hard, you know, in the midst of fighting for all this, I just didn't want her to be, let down when things didn't work. But at the same time, like without optimism, everything seems really terrible, you know? And so, Bleak. yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a great word for it. And, and it, and so she was very optimistic. I was my, doing my best to be as well as you're watching this person go through this. It's very helpless feeling, uh, but her optimism and faith uh, were inspiring. And uh, above all that, her accept, ultimate acceptance uh, was beyond inspiring and admirable. Well, I always love that the opposite of hope is despair. And I think that's why hope is so important, because it doesn't make sense for us to choose to live life in in desperation. Um but I totally understand what you're saying because my husband and I, we're like opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of I'm very much a God has a plan for us. You know, we, you know, as long as we're doing everything that we can and he always emphasizes that everything we can, you know, like we got to do yeah. our part. We have to use our agency. And we always joke that the, the reality of the situation is probably somewhere in the middle um, in terms of making sure that yes, we are using our agency and doing everything so that then we can be like Lindsay and leave it in the hands of God. But that, action that faith faith is action and we have to do something we had i guess apparently we had all these sayings that would help inspire or motivate us but another thing that we would say is knowledge is power because sometimes you're going to go to the doctor and you're going to hear bad news or good news or we don't know news which is maybe more frustrating than the other two sometimes but having that mantra was helpful because no matter what it happened, we just want to know about it and then be able to move forward, uh, having faith in the next steps, having optimism or just acceptance. And 
as hard as it was to hear some things, it just was better to know than to wonder because wondering and not hearing anything just sends you into a tailspin. And so knowledge is power has helped us so much in our lives going through all of that because it just uh, is better to know. I completely it, agree. It's like the the scripture about if you're prepared, you shall not fear. And yeah. I think that's that's the thing that allows us to eliminate fear is what we know. Um, so I love that you shared that. Kevin, there were some extenuating circumstances surrounding your ceiling, your temple ceiling. Tell me about that and why in the end, looking back, that's ended up meaning so much for you. So with our ceiling, it was interesting. So in, so. We got married in January of 2020. We were supposed to be sealed on that day as well. Lindsay wanted Finn to see us married. And so we were planning. The church had changed the policy where you don't have to wait a year if you get civilly married to then get Mm -hmm. married or sealed in the temple. And so we wanted to uh, take advantage of that. She wanted Finn to to see that. I have family uh, that are not a part of the church and I wanted them to see us get married. And so what we were going to do is have that ceremony. And then we're going to go over to the Provo temple. We got married in Provo and then over to the Provo city center temple. However, (laughs) my paperwork got kind of lost in the shuffle with my stake president. And so it did by the time you sent it in, there was no, time and so we just decided we'll just be civilly married and then we'll set a new date and we'll get you know married in the temple or sealed in the temple and of course COVID happens uh and temples are shut down and then even when they started to let it back Lindsay was immunocompromised and we just you know wanted to be careful of that but we wanted people to be there at least our you know immediate families that could go and so we kind of waited and we waited and then finally all the way to November 2021. Well, let me go back just a tad. We found out, uh, I believe in October, maybe late September that she had, was given about six months. That trial you had talked about didn't work and, um, they put her on chemo, but they were trying to be realistic. And so, it was weird though because we back in July or August we had decided we well we need to do this. They're starting to let more people come to the the ceiling and so let's start scheduling this. And so we were actually working on it. And the Provo City Center Temple is a very popular temple and it was pretty booked. And so we actually decided to get married on November or sealed on November fifth at the Jordan River Temple where her parents work, our ordinance workers. And November 5th it's, is my parents' anniversary. We got engaged on her parents' anniversary. So it's kind of like a bookends in a way. And mm-hmm. so that, so yeah, that we got sealed on that day. Kevin, not how, how many days was it between your temple ceiling and when Lindsay passed away? It was only 11 days. Okay. And so talk to me about the grace that you witnessed from her when she knew it was her time to go. Well, it's weird the way things play out. You know, obviously we wanted to get married and sealed on the same day. But the fact that we got sealed in November, just 11 days before her passing, we're just, it was just interesting to see how it all played out. The day before we were to be sealed, Lindsay was in great spirits. She was feeling pretty good. She saw some friends and she even mentioned when we were going to bed, if I feel like this tomorrow, it's just going to be an awesome day. Well, unfortunately she woke up and she was very nauseous and very fatigued and terrible headache, all of the things that come with the side effects of cancer. And, and so she slept and rested and tried and, and she was determined, but she was determined because I said, we can 
put this off or we can, you know, see if they'll do it. Like just, you know, I don't know. Well, I was just trying to think of options because she just was in bad shape. And she's like, no, this is happening today. I want this to happen today, which made me wonder what she felt or maybe knew. But she got up, went to her sister's, got ready. She was in a wheelchair and on oxygen and just it's really struggling. But I, it's like nothing I've ever seen. We went into that ceiling room. She was coughing a lot. She stopped coughing. Color came back into her face. She looked amazing and just, gosh, like the way it felt in that room is like nothing I have never felt and don't expect to ever feel again. It just, it was incredible. So they actually wheeled her to the altar. She they didn't want her to have to get out and kneel through that. And, and then, and I knelt and, and you just see all the people in there that you love so much. And, and you could see there was not a dry eye in the room just because of the love we had. And also, of course, due to the circumstances, the next day, it's so weird how things happen. She felt the way she had the day before, saw friends, felt great. But I think. I don't know. I don't know how things work in the grand scheme, but just seeing her in that ceiling room and just everything kind of coming back for a moment was just amazing. I had called, she had some things going on, so I called her doctor, and on Monday he had given me some information, and she wanted to see him in person, and he was like, I'm happy to do that. And essentially what we went in is he said, "My, I recommend two things. You either go straight to the ER and get checked out because there's a lot of, of your organs that are not functioning properly. Or you go home, you call hospice, and just let them take care of you. And that's a hard choice. You've been fighting and fighting this whole time. And then here it is, you know, this is that moment. And so she asked, you know, for him to give us a moment. And and I was there, of course, and her parents were there. And all of us, you know, just completely rattled by this. And and so we said, well, we should pray about what to do. And we kind of talked first about the difference. You know, what do you do? do? Because you want to keep fighting, right? But she she insisted I don't want to die in a hospital. I just don't. And so we uh, prayed and she asked me to pray, which was not easy, but it was a real honor. And we just asked, like, what do we do? You know, what, like, what's our next step? As soon, and then when I was done, I closed the prayer. We probably sat there in silence for maybe two minutes. I think she was still praying and she lifted her head and said, I'd like to go home. We went home. She went upstairs and laid down. We told Finn later that day with his dad there. And that was, you know, I'm sure you can imagine one of the hardest things to have to do. And, and, and then we just, you know, she went up stairs to bed and and that was the last time she had ever been downstairs and I'm sorry for giving so much detail to this but I just you know that night you know we just looked at each other and just kind of shook our heads in disbelief but then she just started nodding and said I've had a good life and I want to be here and you know but I I believe that there's something more which was really hard because it was hard for her to accept but I think she just realized it was time and she just grace is the best word because she just was very had so much faith in that time and and she was nervous and afraid we don't we we know what we believe but when you're right up 
at the gate of it, it's pretty yeah. intense. But she had a, a lot of faith and she just was, she, when she knew it was time, she just kind of rested and, and let it happen. Everything she had to do, she told Finn. We knew. She told some friends. Everything at her job, she had stopped working just barely a few weeks before this, which is nuts. But she, everything to every I dotted, T crossed, so the next people to follow her had were totally prepared. And so it was just an amazing thing to see. It was difficult. It was sad. It was tragic. But just to see how she handled herself and all that was truly an honor for me. It's beautiful. I I feel like that's the sense of what I got just from social media, just from seeing Lindsay's post there, was that she just handled it with such grace. And I admire her so much for that. When Lindsay passed away, you wrote this on social media. You said that all the feelings were there, but the lasting feeling you'd carry with you was gratitude. And you said gratitude for the time we spent, gratitude that she chose me, gratitude that she trusted me to help her raising her amazing son, Finn, and gratitude for the friendship we shared. We were a perfect match. I am so blessed to have known her and loved her. It truly was an honor to be by her side as she went toe to toe with cancer. Day after day, I was continually impressed by her strength and fortitude. She rose to every occasion, beat the odds so many times, and was full of grace when she knew it was time to rest. How has that gratitude, Kevin, continued to manifest itself for you? Well, I feel like I'll forever be grateful to have been part of her life, even in some of the most difficult aspects of it or times of it. But she gave me a life that I'd always wanted. She left me with an incredible stepson incredible in-laws. I, I don't care what happens in the future with me and my life. They will always be my family and my in-laws and just, you know, just, I, I'm just grateful for, for now in current times for what she left for me, which is just these lasting memories and amazing experience. And I just, it's funny because I'll see people run into people that are her friends and she had so many friends. So sometimes I, I don't remember them and then I'll bring them up. She'll kind of share the friends will share the story they had with her and, uh, or the experience they had with her. And I'll be like, Oh yes. And then I'll be able to kind of finish. Like she told me all about you and this, this and that. And I'm just grateful for, I just have such gratitude for the the legacy that she left. She was a teacher at a junior high, which deserves sainthood just for that, in my <laughs> opinion. But she just loved so much, and it just taught me to be better at that. And so I'm grateful for that example. It was kind of like a comment in my life, in a way, at least in this mortal life. You know, she came in and just impacted me so much that I'll never forget it, and I'll always be grateful for it and and in a interesting way she gave me gratitude for this gospel this plan that we're a part of and uh, under seem or try to understand and the e eternal aspect of it so well said thank you Kevin, in marrying Lindsay, you became a stepdad to her son, and you've mentioned him several times throughout this interview. How old was Finn when you two started dating? Uh, he was seven. Okay. And he's how old now? Uh, he just turned 13 on Sunday, this last Sunday. Okay. And I have been impressed because you obviously love him so much and have continued to build on the relationship that you have with him. Um, his dad has continued to allow you to have a place in his life. And you called being his stepdad life's greatest reward. 
How have you navigated Lindsay's passing together, you and Finn, and how does he continue to bless your life? Well, first off, I am I am forever grateful for the relationship that Lindsay had with her ex-husband. They got along really well. They were actually friends. That's not something you see all the time. I don't think it's something that's easy to do. But for the sake of Finn, they figured that out. I'm grateful for it because if that wasn't the case, I don't know that I would be in Finn's life as much as I am. But because of their great relationship, Finn and Lindsay both expressed the desire for me to still be in Finn's life. And uh, Finn's dad has very generously allowed me to be. So initially, you know, we were kind of going through the same thing, I guess, in different ways. But it's like this is. He would come to stay with me. And at first I was nervous because this is where the memories were with us all together in this house. And and I could see there's a little uh, trepidation and just he didn't want to come into our bedroom because that's where she had passed away. And there's, just, you know, things that a kid experienced that are just, you know, the fact that he experienced this at such a young age is just hard. And I was really unsure of how I was going to help because I was in the midst of my own grief. And he came back and there was just a couple of times. I mean, it's funny because he was the one comforting me. You know, I bring her up and start welling up and, and my voice would start shaking and he would, you know, put his hand on my arm or uh, he would just look at me in the eye. Just to, I think he just wanted to see what I was experiencing. So initially, I don't know if I was any help to him at all because he was comforting me. It should have been the other way around. But but there were times where he had some questions or he, you know, had, you know, there's different things that he wished he would have done. Like a, a, there was like a Lego set that they were supposed to put together and then now they weren't going to. And I just had to assure him that, you know, there's this balance of, it's not like, the end of the world, but it also, I get how hard that is because I'm thinking some of the things too that I wish we would have been able to do together. So we kind of navigated through that together and talked it out. And just as time's gone on, you know, he's, he's doing great. I think somebody told his dad and then his dad told Lindsay and then on Lindsay's last, you know, she wrote me like in her notes app, uh, there's all these different things that she would want to have happen. And one of them was to go to this great place here in Utah called The Sharing Place. And it's a group therapy with people who have lost a sibling or a parent. And the kids all around the same age go in one room and then the parents go in another room and and you kind of go through um, just the process. And part of it is you do need to talk about it and it normalizes it. It doesn't dismiss it, but it normalizes it. And just, I think that experience and us going together and his dad going also has kind of helped us bond through some of that. And then just, you know, he's blessed my life, one, because he's in it, two, because he wants me to be part of his life, and and three, that we've just become very good friends. And uh, while I am a stepdad, I think when he was living here, most of the time I had a more parental role. Uh, now, I you know, when he's with me, it's, it's still kind of like that, but we're more just, uh, you know, kind of connecting on a different level. And, and it's just been, you know, great, like I said, just my great reward in life. Uh, I don't have my own kids. I don't know that I will. So this is probably it for me. And we just, I'm just so thankful for the bond. And, and you know, we I feel like we're the two people that that will love that loves Lindsay the most in this world. And so for me to share that with him is a blessing indeed. Kevin, music has played a big role in your life. Um, that's how you and I became friends, uh, <laughs> was because of music in college. And I just wondered, how has that helped you through this experience and been a blessing as you have grieved? 
Well, that's it's an interesting thing because I do I love music so much. Um, we had an incredible experience with music. You and I, uh, you're very talented um, <laughs> and uh, award winning, if I might add. Uh, but uh, Lindsay and I both that was another way we connected was on music with or with music and and. I love live music and I loved bringing her to concerts with me and seeing how excited she would get for, you know, bands that she liked and, and that kind of thing. I will say since she's passed it, music has been such a tool in the grieving process. Uh, but it's also been really difficult. I, I, I don't want to say mistakenly, but maybe it just was a little early. I went to a concert and this was when you still had to wear masks, you know, and that's, that's never fun. But in this situation, I was actually really grateful for it because this guy uh, who just an incredible singer songwriter um, named Gregory Allen Isaacoff has this song called Idaho and Lindsay's from Idaho and it wasn't on his set list and some random guy just yells out, I know from like the tippy top of this theater. And Gregory grabs this one guitar, walks to the microphone, stops, walks back, grabs this other guitar and plays Idaho. While I'm sitting there in the seats, just bawling Mm -hmm. because it just is this, you know, song about, you know, at least titled in the name of where she's from. And it made me think of her and there's just these great lyrics and, and that happened a number of times, but in, it was a way to still connect with her. If that makes sense. It was a way to go through the grieving process, but not only just with like secular music, like I, I think also with the hymns of the church, like, you know, obviously Abide With Me is one of the most powerful songs when you're dealing with grief. But some that I, I never even thought of, I, a good friend of mine pointed out a talk from Elder Bednar, and I think it was from not this most recent conference, but the one before, and he quotes, Let Us All Press On, which is a really upbeat, you know, and, and enjoyable song to sing in church because it kind of gets this, there's just a lot of energy in the song. But there's a, a line that says that, but an unseen power that will aid me in you. Never heard that song or that line in the same way that I heard it after Lindsay passed. Because there is an unseen power that has aided me through this. You know, same with, I believe it's, I know my Redeemer lives, right? He lives to calm my troubled heart. Never heard that the same way as I've heard it since Lindsay passed. The the hymns of the church have such great doctrine in them and such great uplifting messages that you sometimes I've sing these songs my whole life and I'm now hearing them so much differently. So music has been a major impact in this process. And like I said, it's something that still draws me close to her because we both loved it so much. That's awesome. Following Lindsay's passing, you posted several posts, Kevin, that have really touched me. And I want to kind of highlight a couple of those before we wrap up. You posted a picture of the Salt Lake Temple as it is at the present. And most of us have seen it with the scaffolding all over it. And you said Mm -hmm. that a thought came to you saying, that's you. You wrote, the more I looked at the picture, the more it made sense to me. 2021 has all but broken me. I'm sure the cracks are showing. Losing Lindsay left me in a state of questionable structural stability. In need of my own renovation, reconstruction, and structural reinforcement to mitigate the impact of future seismic activity. It was you, my family, my friends, our savior, and even some thoughtful strangers that scaffolded up around me and prevented me from becoming complete rubble and ruin. You have held me up, reinforced me, and kept me from spiraling to the depths that grief can so easily take a person. How did others provide this scaffolding for you in the wake of Lindsay's passing, and what did that look like in practice? 
That's a really good question and uh, a really interesting experience experience for me because I just remember feeling that as I looked at that temple because I was just looking at it like in the state of repair, you know, and and then like it says in my post that I just felt this, that's you right now, basically. And I don't know what that means. And then it hit me and I mean, I was just floored by Lindsay's passing. We saw it coming. We knew it was going to happen. And I can attest that you're still just not going to be prepared. And that's the hard part is you just want to be, but, you know, you're losing this important person to you. And so I was pretty wrecked. But literally from minute one, people were stepping up for me and, and holding me up my you know, namely like my big sister Denise showed up within an hour of Lindsay's passing, stayed with me that night. So I didn't have to stay home alone a few nights actually till I finally was like, you have to go back to your family. Like they need you, <laughs> you know, like this is, but I mean, she, we woke up the next morning and, and that's the thing that's crazy about this stuff too is you just lose this person. You don't want to do anything. But then all of a sudden, there's all these plans. You have to plan this major event and, and the funeral, you know. And in some ways, it's good because you have something to do. In other ways, like for me, my mind was mush. I had major fog. And I was like, I don't know where or what. And, and this is the one area we had talked about it. But Lindsay, you know, from the time she started hospice, to the time she passed away was seven days. And like the next thing on our agenda was to talk about, you know, headstones and burial location and funeral plans. And fortunately, we got a ton of the funeral plans done. But then, like, I didn't know where to bury her. I didn't know a lot of things in that regard. And my sister was just incredible. She was never like, well, let's do this, let's do this. She would always give kind of options or what do you think about this? Or I booked like a couple or a few um, cemeteries we can go walk through and just very patient with me, very thoughtful and kind. And and she had a style very similar or has a style very similar to Lindsay's. And so they were able to, but she was able to say, yeah, I think she would like this or maybe this or maybe these things. And, and it just it eased me uh calmed me and it let me just kind of go through that process of planning all of that and then you know within that time of planning her funeral again her family was amazing my family was great and just friends i mean i had you know i have friends that who'd who'd flown up for the ceiling and then we're back you know from out of state you know and then we're back here uh, for the funeral, which is just not, you know, easy to do, but it just showed their friendship and it, and it meant so much to me. Um, I had people call I had you know, obviously people just do so much in those moments, uh, because it was, and it was really holding me up because I just felt like, you know, I just didn't want to get out of bed sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still waiting for the history channel to call me and, and, set up that documentary about that monumental day that Kevin got out of bed, you know, it's just this historic event because it was <laughs> just so hard sometimes. And then sometimes I get up and I'm like, I can't believe I'm functioning today. And sometimes you're on autopilot, sometimes not. But in any of those moments, I never got too far without a call or a visit or a, Hey, let's go do this. Or, you know, it just, I was just being held up until I felt reinforced to continue my life, you know, and like I mentioned, even Finn, this young boy who just lost his mom was like a comfort to me. And, and one of those scaffolding that was just holding me up so I didn't crumble into nothing. Well, I, that's one thing that I have noticed, Kevin, is you are, you're a great friend yourself. And so it's no surprise that you have attracted people that are good friends. But I've noticed how much it seems like people love you and want to be there for you. And I think that's a credit to you and who you are. 
In April 2022, you wrote this, as a way of strengthening my faith, I like to put myself in the story or that place in history. Last night, I was in bed and I thought about those who were there and loved Jesus and followed him to the bitter end of his mortal life. What were they thinking the night Jesus died or the Saturday night before he rose from the dead? Were they anxiously awaiting the next day to see him again? Did Mary Magdalene cry herself to sleep, wondering if she could have done more to save his life? Did Peter doubt or question his faith in what he had been taught in person by the Savior himself? I have the benefit of 2,000 years of the resurrection being taught. This was happening in real time for them. The night Lindsay died, I remember lying in bed asking myself all of these questions. I did cry myself to sleep, but I woke up at 4 a.m. with a deeply peaceful feeling, more peace than I think I have ever felt. The feeling was one of love reconfirming to me what I have believed to be true, an afterlife and a reunion with God and loved ones. Was it Lindsay touching my heart, letting me know that she was good? Was it the spirit of God bringing a promised comfort during a dark and sad time? Was it my mind recalling all the things I've learned and been taught throughout my own life, bringing me that peace? I think the answer is yes. I wondered for you, Kevin, how has the hope of the resurrection brought you peace and comfort and hope through this period of time? Well, that was an incredible night for me and morning, to say the least. I think when you lose somebody and watch them go through this, like, I don't know that I ever, like, questioned my faith. Like, I didn't have a crisis of faith by any means, But I think there is a thing in there where it's like not even being tested, but just there it is. Like, if you believe this, like this this is the time to believe it, you know. And I just remember thinking, I guess, like about those people back then. It's so easy to believe history, I think. But in real time, like I just I just wonder, I'll always wonder until maybe one day I'll get to interview them or something and just say like, what was that like? You know, I mean, we have recountings and such, but just a personal one-on-one account would be pretty awesome, I think. But I think I was thinking that because I think I I was in the situation where this person had passed and my belief and what I've been taught is that they will, like the Savior, live again and be resurrected. And, And so I just... I think it just shot me back to the time Jesus was on the earth. The amazing part about that is there are other people who had that same encounter at that same time, which was just a special, very special experience. But the resurrection has brought me hope because I do want to see Lindsay again. I, I think part of marrying somebody with cancer, I think part of doing that was because I have a strong faith and belief that no matter if this, if she was to live 20 years or two, that it wouldn't be the end for us. And that's brought me a lot of peace and comfort. I still struggle and grieve, but that feeling I had at 4 a.m., I can recall on that. And I, my testimony is where in the place where I just believe that. It will happen. And having that belief has brought a calm to my life. As much as I miss her, I do believe I'll see her again. And that sounds amazing. Well, I believe that it will be amazing. And I look forward to, I know I've told you this, but because I only met Lindsay one time, I look forward to the chance to get to be friends with her. Kevin, in a Facebook post on the one-year anniversary of Lindsay's burial, you shared this quote by President Nelson. Irrespective of age, we mourn for those loved and lost. Mourning is one of the deepest expressions of pure love. It is a natural response in complete accord with divine commandment. Thou shalt live together in love in so much that thou shalt weep for the loss of them that die. Moreover, we can't fully appreciate joyful reunions later without tears. 
tearful separations now. The only way to take sorrow out of death is to take love out of life. You also quote Queen Elizabeth, who said, nothing can begin to take away the anguish and the pain of these moments because grief is the price we pay for love. Why would you say that love, the love you were able to experience with Lindsay was worth the pain of grief and separation? Well, that first quote by President Nelson was actually a quote she requested to have read at her funeral. That was one of the things she had put in her notes and her mom read it. And so I just wanted to share that with everybody who maybe wasn't there or who hadn't heard that before. It's just a just a beautiful uh, quote by President Nelson. This is a good question because it's worth it. It was worth it. I searched, I looked for her for a long time. And... I was so blessed to spend, you know, the time we had together. I think we always knew it wouldn't be for too long on this earth. And so I think we we made a point to not try to, you know, I think sometimes you think, well, we don't have this much time, so let's try and do like everything all at once. And I think, I can't remember who said it, but we just talked about it. And it was like, we just want to have a normal life for as long as we can. And we did, you know, like we had a home and a family and a dog and uh, just this great love for each other. And like I said, I looked for that for a really long time. And she was just, like I said, we were a perfect match. I'll say she was perfect for me. She let me be me. I wanted her to be her. There was no you know, trying to change each other. It was really, I felt loved and accepted by her, uh, which is just the greatest feeling in the world. And it overpowers any of the pain or grief that I have. But these quotes have said, like, the price for love uh, when you lose that person is is very high. And uh, I have definitely felt felt that pain, but it just is so worth it because she made me and continues to make me so happy and full of joy about our relationship and the hope of it continuing after uh, this life. Like, I think that reunion will just be incredible. And I think of, you know, other, other couples and people who've gone through this. And I just, that's kind of the lasting thing is this hurts so much. But how sweet will that reunion be? And like the reason we feel this is because of how much we loved that person. And uh, anyway, I just, uh, I would do it all over again because I just think it was that worth it um, to be with her and to, to have somebody so incredible love me and get to love her is just, it's just the best. Kevin, thank you so much for being willing to revisit tender memories and to give us a chance to get to know Lindsay a little bit. And for your testimony, it really means so much to me. My last question for you is what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? You know, Morgan, I have listened to this podcast so many times. And every time I listen to the podcast, I think of this last question. And I always wonder, like, for myself, like, what is my answer to that? I never, ever thought that I would have the opportunity to give that answer on this podcast. So it is a real honor. I'm actually going to, when Lindsay passed away, the Christmas following, her college roommates, who are very dear friends of hers, gave me and her family, each member of her family, this quote of hers that we hang on our walls in our home. And I'm going to read that as my answer, if I could. Okay, perfect. And she just says, I'm learning that when you just love people, your heart has so much more room to love. What a simple statement 
with so much weight and so much power. And that was encapsulates her right there in a quote. She just loved people. I think to be all in this gospel is to simply love people, not just people in the church, not just the people next door or on our street, not just our families, people, all people. And uh, that's not always the easiest. Uh, we've been in some interesting times the last few years, and sometimes it's not easy to love everybody. But like she says in here that she's learning that when you just love people, the ability that we have to continue to love uh, grows. And, it, you know, I liken it, you know, That's... to the great commandments, you know, love the Lord thy God and love your neighbor. And it's just, that was, that was her. And that is my um, feeling of what it means to be all in the gospel. Thank you so much, Kevin. It has been such a, a blessing for me to be able to talk with you. And I appreciate your willingness and your time so, so much. Thank you, Morgan, for having me and for just having this podcast. As I was trying to figure out what to say in the intros for this episode, I started to read tributes to Lindsay online. There were the students who called Lindsay their safe haven and said she was the only teacher at their middle school who didn't make them feel self-conscious. There was also her friend from church who wrote, We were in the Young Women's Presidency together, and she helped me see that despite having a different background than most members of the church, I still had something to give the young women. It was a special time in my life. I found a lot of self-worth through the church, and Lindsay was part of that. I thought I'd let Lindsay have the last word in this episode as Kevin was kind enough to share an audio clip of Lindsay that was recorded right before she passed. So, you know, romantic love, you give a lot more of yourself to someone, but you can, you can love people by just being kind or sharing or serving. And it takes a part of you to, to love someone else and to be loved. You have to sacrifice. I've never regretted, you know, sacrificing time to lay around to help someone else. I've never sacrificed a show that I wanted to watch to help someone else. And to have the opportunity to serve others is really important to me. I think that you have to look for those and you have to kind of build that into your life that you you do care about others. And you can say that you care about others, but, but it really is the actions that you take um, that that is more important. A huge thank you to Kevin Ralph for sharing Lindsay with us today and for sharing his testimony as well. A big thanks to Derek Campbell of Mix It Six Studios for his help with this episode. And thank you for listening. We'll look forward to being with you again next week.